welcome to episode 76 of Board Game Blitz, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network and a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to relax after a busy day. Board Game Blitz is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. This week, we're talking about chill games. First, we discuss a couple of games we've played recently, like Bandito and Just One. Then, we talk about games that we love that make us feel calm, cool, and collected. Finally, we wrap things up with a look at the etymology of the word calm. And now, here are your hosts, Amby and Crystal. One quick announcement before we hop into the main episode. We wanted to congratulate our friends over at Ludology on winning Best Podcast in the Golden Geek Awards. Yay! We love Ludology. They have been putting out amazing, great content for a really long time, and it is well-deserved. So congratulations to Jeff and Gil. Uh, We're very excited that you all won, especially since Jeff is going to be leaving the show soon. We're very excited to see Emma come in and add her spin to the show, and this was a nice little send-off, I would say. Uh, We also wanted to thank all of you who went and voted in the Golden Geek Awards, whether it was for us or for other shows or for games or whatever. Uh, We really appreciate the support that a bunch of you showed up us online and we're just we're really really grateful and we're very happy that we've been nominated two years in a row that's honestly a really big achievement and we're very proud of it yeah thank you everyone recently i played a game called bandito which was published in 2016 it's designed by martin nedergaard anderson and published by helvetique which is a swiss publishing company they make these small box games, they look kind of like oink games. <laughs> so it's kind of similar to that, but I think this publishing company was around before oink. But anyways, Bandito is a cooperative card game for one to four players. It takes like 10 minutes and all the cards are different paths. If you've played Saboteur, the cards are kind of like that. There's paths with like six different possible exits and then you can just play the cards down and line them up to make a whole tunnel path that keeps going. And some of the paths end up in dead ends. And you're trying to um, make a bunch of dead ends, basically, because you you start with a prisoner in a cell. That's just one of the cards and it has some exits and you have to lay a card so that the paths match up and you try to make it so that the prisoner can't escape. So everything loops around or is a dead end and then everything's blocked off. And if you run out of cards before that happens, then you lose. And if you're able to do that before the deck runs out, then you win. So I played two players with Toby twice, and we won pretty easily each time. Um, And we were playing on hard mode. There's easy and hard mode. The the prisoner card is double-sided, so the hard mode has more paths coming out of it. But it it was pretty easy still, because there are a lot of the dead end cards in your hand, so we could just save those up and play them when, when we had the ends. And then, yeah, so... So not so hard, basically. (laughs) Yeah, not so hard. So I think if we played again, we would probably take out some of those cards and house rule it so that we have to make more actual loops. Like, because you can maneuver it so that you get two exits and then you have a card that has like the loop around so that it loops those two exits together and then there's no exit there. But yeah, I think it also would be good for kids. It says on the box ages six plus. So I think it's it's... Like, the rules are really simple, and it's a cool concept and pretty fun. Like, I like the spatial aspect of playing the cards, and it's cooperative. So I think it would be good, like, with with family, with kids. Yeah, that was Bandito. Yeah, it sounds like, I think if you're a group of adults of any size playing a cooperative game, you generally want it to be pretty difficult Mm -hmm. or even nearly impossible to win, especially on your first play. Like if I play a cooperative game and I win on my first play, I'm Mm -hmm. immediately a little bit skeptical. (laughs) And obviously sometimes luck can factor into that. But when it comes to cooperative games, I usually want them to be pretty difficult because if you can beat it easily the first time, I feel like it kind of removes a lot of some of the, like the fun of figuring out the best ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am also going to be talking about a cooperative game. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned this one in our 2018 Blitzies episode. Uh, It was my favorite cooperative game of 2018. And I've been getting to play it again recently. That is Just One. Uh, It is published by Repos Productions, designed by Ludovic Rowdy and Bruno Sauter. Sauter? Sauter. 
think it's French. I'm really bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Just One is a really simple game. You can have up to seven players, and all of the players have a small, long dry erase board and a dry erase marker, and then there is a deck of cards. Uh, you draw out a certain number of cards based on the number of players that go into the deck in the middle of the table, and whoever the active player is in a round uh, writes a number onto their dry erase board, one through five, and then flips up the first card in the deck so they can't see it, but everyone else can. Uh, there will be five words on that card, numbered one through five, whatever number the person wrote down, that is the word that you're going to be trying to get that person to guess this round. The way you get them to guess it is every single person writes down a single word clue on their dry erase boards. So they, everybody writes down one word, but then the person who will be guessing closes their eyes and everyone reveals their dry erase boards to each other. And if any of the words match, they get flipped over and will not be shown to the clue guesser. So you're often trying to write down words that aren't super obvious. Like if the word was soda, you wouldn't necessarily want to write Coke because that's a really common kind of soda and somebody else might write it down too. And then both of them are going to get removed from the game. Uh, but if everybody writes really obscure clues, then it's sometimes harder to guess what the word is. And also, since everybody else is also trying to not write common things, sometimes nobody writes a common <laughs> thing, and those turn into really funny games. I love this one so much. It is great to break out when you have kind of that odd number of players, like since it can accommodate seven easily, it works really well with that player count. It is fun. Everyone I've introduced it to really likes it, and everyone I've played it with loves it. I actually heard some of my friends online recently had a group larger than seven, so they combined two copies of the game and played just two, where they had, <laughs> there were two words every single round, and then all of the people writing down clues could choose which one they wanted to give a clue for, but the person guessing didn't know like you didn't, you don't know which words go with what clue. So they are, they're looking at a whole bunch of words, trying to find out two different words. That sounds really hard. <laughs> Apparently it was very difficult, but also very amusing. And I want to try it. So now not only do I have to buy a single copy of just one, I need two copies so I can play just two uh, because it sounds great. During one of my recent plays of just one. So we were playing with all seven people. So we had six people writing down clues. I was the clue guesser and two of the words matched and got flipped over. So I only got to see four clues and all of my friends thought I wasn't going to get it. The clues that I got to see were cathedral, dark, eyeliner, and font, F-O-N-T. And font was the one that I like latched onto immediately because I work in marketing. So I'm pretty familiar with font names. And I was like, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And I just like kind of like hunkered down and stared at the clues for a little while. And then I just had this moment and I was like, oh, it's Gothic. And everybody <laughs> flipped out. They were so excited because they really didn't think I was going to get it. But all of those clues were really good. But it's, yeah. it's funny how in the moment it's hard to piece that stuff together. Like now that I know it after the fact, it seems so simple but it really wasn't <laughs> at the time. I highly recommend this one. It would work with families, with adults, with children, with just about anybody, truthfully, because it's so easy to pick up and learn. And I like that it's cooperative too. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you haven't checked this one out yet, definitely add it to your list to take a look at. That is Just One. Yeah, Just One is a lot of fun. And cooperative party games, that's kind of rare having that many players with a cooperative game, I think. That's true. I think there's definitely some like team-based mm -hmm. party games, but yeah, there aren't a lot of cooperative ones, really. Yeah. I'm actually trying to think of any others and <laughs> none come to mind. I'm sure there are, but. For today's thematic discussion, we wanted to get into a state of Zen. I'm going to try to speak a little more slowly than I typically do, <laughs> which isn't that hard since I speak very quickly <laughs> most of the time. Uh, it's funny, I listen to podcasts at 1.5 speed normally, and it makes people sound normal to me because I talk very quickly. So we're going <laughs> to... We're going to slow things down and we're going to talk about chill games. I actually am not going to keep that voice up for the whole time because I can't. I literally can't function like that. 
<laughs> it's just not, it doesn't work for me. But we are going to talk about chill games, games that, you know, like are very easygoing, make us feel good and calm and just like, I don't know, that like nice butter zone. Not, not, and we've talked about comfort games in the past, and this is not that. We are not talking about just games that we are really familiar with and therefore they're comfortable. We're talking about games that evoke a sense of chill or calm. And I think that is a different category, although there may be some crossover between those two categories. Yeah, for me, there's a little bit of overlap because when I was thinking of comfort games, I was also thinking of relaxing during the game for some of them. So one of them, or I think the main one that overlaps is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective because for me, that's relaxing. Just You're just reading a lot. <laughs> it's mostly just reading a lot. Another game that's similar, reading a lot, is Legacy of Dragonholt. Oh, yeah. Which I I just played solo, and it's a reading, choose-your-own-adventure role-playing game. And that's very comforting to me. I mean, very relaxing to me because I, I just sitting by myself and reading. Um but yeah, yeah, no, it was same same kind of experience for me when I was playing through that game. Very chill, like very enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Like even though some of the things happening within the story were stressful, playing it was not at all. Yeah. But yeah, uh, um, outside of reading games, uh, this was a difficult category for me because a lot of the games I like tend to be stressful. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you like a lot of real-time games, and I yes. would say that is generally the opposite of chill. Yeah, and, and then I think, I was, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, um, because I'm an introvert, games are already inherently stressful for me because it's playing with other people. So it's a more stressful activity for me. So when I want to relax personally, I tend to do more solo things like watch TV or do a puzzle or read. So that's why games that involve a lot of reading, I think, are relaxing for me because it's more like a similar to activities that I associate with relaxing, I guess. <laughs> that makes sense. I just recently backed uh, the season two of the graphic novel adventures from Van mm. Ryder Games on Kickstarter. It's funny because even like even though the themes in that one, like there's two pirate ones and I don't even mm-hmm. like pirates that much, <laughs> but I've heard enough good things about the graphic novel adventures that I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. And I have a feeling that I'm going to enjoy those quite a bit, but those will probably be very chill for me. Yeah, I think yeah. really any of these games with like heavy story elements mm-hmm. in them can can be very relaxing. Yeah, I agree. I think some of the other games that are chill for me are games where the theme is chill. And that's mm-hmm. not to say all games with a chill theme are chill, <laughs> but a lot <laughs> of them are. So things like Takedo, Herbaceous, Wingspan, mm-hmm. those uh, Kanagawa. Like Kanagawa is about painting a lovely portrait. And it just grows and grows as you're putting the cards out. And it's just so pretty. Uh, Reef is similar. Um, you're building a nice little coral reef. And it's. I think with a, the theme in a lot of these games is there isn't a ton of player interaction. And there's definitely no negative things that you're directly doing to the other players in these types of games, at least for me. If there's direct conflict in a game... Uh, it's usually not going to be very chill, at least Mm -hmm. for me, because I don't enjoy direct conflict. Number nine is very chill. I would say some abstract games are chill, but not all, especially two-player ones that can be pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was actually, I mentioned this to Andy before we started recording, but when I was trying to come up with my list, I actually was thinking about it, and I think My Little Scythe actually would count as a chill game for me, which seems counterintuitive. Obviously, Scythe, the regular game, is big and epic, and there's lots of battles. Well, there's some battles. I've never played it. I still haven't played Scythe. (laughs) But my little Scythe, even though you can fight with the other players, it's pie fights. It's very lighthearted, and it doesn't like negatively set back people that much at all. So I, I, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, yeah, like every play of my little Scythe that I've had has been pretty chill. And that's kind of cool that Mm -hmm. they were able to take a game that is inherently kind of intense and distill it down to something simple and chill. And honestly, if you are a person who likes lighter games with some cool strategy in them uh, and you're okay with cute art, My Little Scythe is really fun. I love it. I actually 
I think I'm just going to buy a copy. I, it's one that I really <laughs> want in my collection. Wow. Um, yeah, I, it's so good. I don't, I still do want to play Scythe at some point, but if I bought regular Scythe, I feel like it would not hit the table as often. Whereas my little Scythe is shorter. It's easier to get to the table. It's easier to teach. Oh, and that is another factor for me in chill games is how easy is it to teach to a group of new players? Because I'm often teaching games and I don't always enjoy doing that. So if the game is an easy teach, I think that also help makes it be more chill of an experience for me. Yeah. On that note, like some game, a game that I think is kind of chill or at least how we play it is Concept. So Concept is one one of those guessing games it's a party game where it's kind of like charades or Pictionary where one person is trying to get other people to guess a word, but there's a board of pictures and you're just placing down tokens on them to try to get, get them to guess the concept first. For us, we don't keep score or anything and we're just playing until we get tired of playing and there's no time limit. So, so it's more relaxing than those other games where there's like a time limit and you're keeping score and you're playing against teams or something. So for us, I think concept is a relaxing or chill game. It's like really easy to play and something that you can play when you're really tired at the end of a convention or something. That's interesting because (laughs) while I also don't play with a time limit or keep Mm -hmm. score, concept is so stressful for me (laughs) because I'm one of those people that I think I'm brilliant in the midst of a game like that. And so I will come up with like the perfect places to put the little exclamation point token and the cubes. And I've like thought it all out and it's all brilliant and nobody's getting it. So then I just take (laughs) the exclamation point and I'm literally like tap, 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 tapping it (laughs) on the spot. And I'm like, come on, pay attention to this. And nobody's getting it. And I I can't divert very easily once I have an idea in my head, Mm -hmm. uh, which pretty much means I'm not that brilliant clearly but uh so I yeah that game it's fun I like it but it's less chill for me (laughs) just because of who I am as a person yeah yeah I guess that part can be not as chill but then when we do that we just have someone else help out the clue giver so oh okay um, that's cool it's like a big we play it as a big cooperative thing which I think cooperative games tend to be more chill for me unless they're real time (laughs) which is a lot of the games I like um But also, I think the art helps make a game more chill. So one that I was thinking of that has a little bit of relax to it is um, The Ravens of Three Sahashri, which is a two-player cooperative game. It's puzzly. Part of it is not relaxing in that you're trying to figure out what the other person is thinking, and that can be kind of stressful. But when you're just doing your turn, uh, it's relaxing just placing the cards down because they're very pretty, and it's like a little puzzle. So that can be relaxing and also just playing with just one other player for for me is is relaxing we asked some of you on social media to tell us some of your favorite chill games and we got a lot of crossover in our lists things like herbaceous uh takaido uh number nine some people said suro and patchwork Mm -hmm. cottage garden uh, one of our commenters said, Suro, no real brain power required. And I think that's actually a good point as well. Games that you don't have to think really hard to play. Uh, mm-hmm. And Suro is still an interesting game and there's still interesting decisions to be made, but you don't have to think very hard about them. So that's pretty cool. Over on our Facebook page, someone said, Bob Ross, the art of chill, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I have not played that one. So. I actually, I won it in a contest from the official bob ross twitter account wow and i know i was very like freaking out uh i love bob ross i've loved bob ross since i was a kid i literally did bob ross painting kits when i was like eight or nine years old so like before bob ross was popular again on twitch i already loved bob ross (laughs) i was cool before (laughs) bob ross got popular other people said things like splendor rose king Uh, Somebody else said Wingspan. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Someone said Steam Park, which it was funny because I actually considered that briefly because the building of your park feels very chill, but there is a real-time aspect of the dice rolling in that game that is very not chill, at least for me. So 
Uh, our friend Becky from the Board Games in Bed podcast said that Quicks and Legacy of Dragonholt are their chill games at the moment. And Kelly says Carcassonne, but that's because she always wins. <laughs> so <laughs> that's an interesting way of looking at it. Becky and Kelly are uh, have a, a little daughter that was just born uh, just a couple of months ago. And so I know they've been struggling to get some gaming time in. I'm very happy that they've been releasing new podcast episodes. So shout out to Becky and Kelly. You guys are awesome. And then Joshua, um, who works over at Gray Fox Games, our sponsor, and is a friend of the show for sure, not just because he sponsors us, but because he's awesome, uh, said Dragonheart. And I am only like newly familiar with this game. It's a two-player game that is out of print, and it is on Board Game Arena. And uh, Nicole from the Great Way Games podcast actually introduced it to me on Board Game Arena, and it is super fun. I really liked Dragonheart a lot, and I hope that someone brings it back at some point. Or if somebody has a used copy of Dragonheart that they're hanging on to and they don't want, let me know. I will buy it from you because I've only played it online and I would love a real copy of that game. Over on Twitter, we had similar answers, but some new ones that showed up there. Baron Park, Kerala, Okie Doki, Machi Koro, uh, and Viticulture with the Tuscany expansion. That one's interesting because it's a heavier game, but I wonder if it's just like the making wine theme is what makes it chill. And people said tile placement games tend to be pretty chill. Ooh, Lotus. That's a good one. I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. I own Lotus, and that one is pretty chill. Um, It is a little bit stressful when somebody takes the flower that you were just about to complete. (laughs) But honestly, just building flowers out is pretty neat. Tons of great responses from people on social media. Thank you all for contributing to the episode. If you all did not respond to one of our things and you want to tell us about your favorite chill game, head over to our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Board Game Geek Guild, all the places, and tell us about your favorite chill games. We would love to hear about them. I'm sure there's some that we missed. For this week's etymology segment, I'm continuing our chill vibe by looking at the origins of the word calm in its adjective form. The English word calm originated in the late 14th century when it meant, in regard to the sea, windless or without motion or agitation, or in regard to the wind, light or gentle. It may have come from the old French calm, spelled the same way except for an E at the end, which meant tranquility or quiet. Or it could have come from the old Italian word calma, which meant quiet or fair weather. That word potentially came from the late Latin word calma, spelled C-A-U-M-A, which meant heat of the midday sun. That doesn't sound like it makes sense (laughs) right at first, but in Italy during this period, when the sun was at its hottest, it was often a time when everyone was resting and was still. There was nothing going on. So that's where why it makes sense that heat of the midday sun would kind of mean something regarding calm. The word then goes back to the Greek word kauma, spelled with a K, which meant heat, especially of the sun, which came from the word Cain, meaning to burn, although its spelling was influenced by the Latin word calare, which simply meant to be hot. So obviously the hotness transformed into heat of the midday sun, transformed into calm. It took a journey. The figurative application of the word calm in regard to social or mental conditions, as in free from agitation or passion, originated in the 1560s. Since the practice of yoga is often associated with calmness, I did a little digging for those of you who like random facts. The Guinness World Record for the largest yoga class was accomplished on World Yoga Day, June 21st, 2018, and involved 100,984 participants in India. That is a whole lot of namaste. And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, BoardGameBlitz.com, for video and blog content, as well as to get links to all our social media pages. This episode was sponsored by Gray Fox Games. On the day this episode releases, Tsukuyumi Full Moon Down will have one day left before it ends on Kickstarter. So hurry and go back it now. Gray Fox Games. Quality games cleverly crafted. If you're enjoying the show, you can rate and review us on your podcast provider or consider becoming a patron. For as little as $1 a month, you can unlock access to unedited episodes and our private Slack channel, which lets you chat with us and other Blitz computers directly. Head to patreon.com slash boardgamebliss to become a patron today. 
Our theme song was composed by Andrew Morrow. Technical support provided by Toby Mao. Board Game Blitz is part of the Dice Tower Network. Until next time, relax, play through it. When you want a game, do it. Bye, everyone! Bye! Visit our website, boardgameblitz.com, for video and blog content, as well as the... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a blooper. It's not an exciting one, but it's something. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Visit our... I'll just start over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alliteration time. Alliteration. <laughs> Last episode, we asked you to retheme a game about gem mines for notoriously slow animals who like to be deceptive. We are pretty sure a lot of you got this one. What was it, Ambi? That was Sneaky Sloth Splendor. That one's a little bit of a tongue twister, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> All right. This week, remember, the answer is going to be three words that all start with the same letter. We're asking you to retheme a game about traveling down a Japanese road for a natural disaster that's really delicious. Good luck, everyone.